Hello and welcome to Pop to Culture on D Program with Carrie Smith. I am one of your hosts, Carrie, and I'm here with a mystery van. Hello, Mystery Chris. Well, hi, Carrie. How are you? You know that there's a fan club forming for your voice. Is there? Wow. <laughs> yes. I have to mail out membership cards and photos of my cartoon. <laughs> it has to you have to figure out how you just put like a one of those codes that you scan and then it goes to an audio recording of your voice. <laughs> Hello, fan. Insert <laughs> Um, welcome, it's, if it's your first time here, this is a live show that we do on Wednesday nights that's about pop culture, and tonight we are talking about Afrofuturism, which is something I knew nothing about and only started reading about because Mystery Chris was telling me about it. We're going to learn a little about it tonight. Uh, before that, I just want to make, we have one important announcement. We are finally bringing back Book Club. Uh, thanks for being patient with us for the move, my move, and all kinds of uh, technical things that we've been going through. Uh, we're doing this book on Sunday, The Real Anthony Fauci by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And we are doing this book club. Uh, it's Sunday at three o'clock Texas time. We are doing it in locals only. And there's a couple reasons for that. I'll explain quickly. One is that for the subject matter, we just don't want to have this one on YouTube because I think we'll get a strike immediately. Um, and it's it's kind of a cool opportunity uh, to try out locals because we've been, been wanting to try out, you know, how does that work and how do we do stuff if we want to do members only content and have perks for being a, a paid supporter. Um, if you would like to join us, go over to locals, create an account. And if you have any problems uh, getting in there because some people have and I'm still figuring it out. We have an email address and thank you to Sisters and Some Yarn. She's helping me with this, set this up. The email is deprogrammedpod at gmail.com so you can email that and let us know if you're having any trouble getting into book club. You can be on camera. You can be in the chat. There, or there, there. she put it in the chat. Thanks, Amy. Um, so you guys can uh, contact us there. Okay, I think that's it. I think that's the only announcement. But we we have to start off with the very uh, disturbing news I learned right before we went live, Gary. Wait, are you talking about what I just told you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Why would you do that to me? <laughs> Uh, they'll never know. People will never know. Now. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, people. No, I can't. No, I just had some unnecessary drama today. No, so, not that part. Oh, I don't know what it. I don't know what you're talking about. It's okay. About whatever it is, we shouldn't say it. Don't okay. say it. I don't. I'm afraid now about what it is. No. <laughs> it's about the movie. Oh, that news. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, uh, well, I had told Mystery Chris, he was like, when we were going over this topic, Afrofuturism, which apparently is a relatively new term in the past few years, but they've been going back and looking at old um, different types of fashion and movies and stuff and saying, this is an early example of Afrocentricism. So now different things are getting called, sorry, Afrofuturism. And um, when we were talking, we were going over a bunch of notes and he quickly was like, and you've seen Black Panther, right? And I was like, yeah. And then we kept going. And then we just got on the, after I did some research today, I realized I have not seen Black Panther. I thought you meant, I was thinking of Spawn. <laughs> and then I called Carrie a racist and we <laughs> started fighting. Was <laughs> <laughs> I look, I confused Spawn with Black Panther. <laughs> What's the big deal? <laughs> hey, well, at least you saw the movie because, you know, Prior to Black Panther coming out, and you had all these articles talking about there's never been a black superhero in a movie ever. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? Blade and Spawn. And come on now. Blade, right? Exactly. I've Your seen Blade man. too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so will I be able to keep up since I actually haven't seen Black Panther? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you've seen images of it, right? 
<laughs> I've seen images. I know the gist. I think okay, Wakanda. Yeah. Somebody yeah. says she was thinking of Blank Man. Blank Man. Yeah, Damon Wayans. I love Blank Man. J J. Yes, Blank Man. Okay. <laughs> well, that's that's my guilty admission. <laughs> uh, so where do we start with Afro well, uh Let's start off with the movie trailer for The Woman King, which uh, this is going to be our Africa episode. Africa. We'll, we'll probably do more others, but I'm just calling it the quintessential African episode of pop culture. So uh, I recently saw the trailer for a new movie starring uh, um, Viola Davis called The Woman King. And it is about a all-female warrior group that fought for the kingdom of uh, Dahomey, I believe, which is uh, located in present day uh, Benin. And so this is the movie trailer. Uh, I wanted Carrie to watch this and tell me what. Well, I, will, I, I like it. So okay, okay. I'll spoil it, what I think about it. But here, okay. let's go. An evil is coming that threatens our kingdom. Strong behavior. Our freedom. But we have a weapon. A strong independent black woman. We are not prepared for. I might have to pause this so that we don't get another video taken down. Like pause right. and talk about it. Uh, what do you think so far? <laughs> I, uh, well i i have some commentary but i i'll save it toward the, to end, the end okay well so i like far, this this okay. is the part of a trailer i really like he's building the tensions building the music yeah. that you know you're gonna about to hit a crescendo yeah okay. my king the europeans wish to conquer us they will not stop until the whole of africa is theirs we must fight back for our people. Paneska, you're asking me to take them to war. War. Some things are worth fighting for. Don't know. True story. Based on a true story. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, leading up to it, I was like, hmm. Then it's a true story. I was like, mm, okay, that's a little bit more believable. And you told me it's true. Okay. Okay. You are called to join the King's Guard. No kingdom in all of Africa shares this privilege. Train hard, fight harder. We fear no one. And we fear no pain. I offer you a choice. So, the, if you uh, recognize her, Lashana Lynch, she was in Captain Marvel and also the most recent James Bond movie. Die. <laughs> I have to say this. At least she looks like a badass. At least they didn't get a very fey, kind of weak-looking woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She fits it well, surprisingly. Because mm -hmm. if you had told me on paper that she was going to be playing like some warrior, I'd be like, eh. But it's a little bit believable. Mm -hmm. you, you must kill your tears. We are the fair of victory! Okay. So, give me your thoughts. Well, I like it. Uh, as I said, I, I I think they maybe that maybe I just like 
if I go and see it, maybe it won't be as good as the trailer, but I think they did a good job cutting the trailer. Um, they build the tension, the music's crescendoing, the action. I like the lead actress. I do think they cast it well with her. And uh, I get the goosebumps when the music crescendos. So that makes me want to go see the movie. Is that too shallow of a reason for liking it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so... I it, visually it looks good. Action looks good. My initial thoughts when I saw it was one that this is a movie being made in the wake of Black Panther, trying to capitalize on popularity. Of, oh yeah, a kind of pro-black, you know, pan-African type of um, thing being put out there. But also, given the culture that we're in right now, where you see a lot of you know females who are doing things that defy physics. <laughs> You know, a lot of times when they're fighting men that are twice their size and just beating them up, it's this very kind of like girl power feminism type stuff. I thought it kind of looked like that. But, you know, given that it's based on a true story, I was like, OK, well, maybe maybe it's more more uh, plausible. But here's the interesting thing that this uh, trailer didn't mention. So I noticed in the comments for this video, not just on YouTube, but on other uh, platforms. Apparently, the kingdom of Dahomey was evolved in the slave trade. Okay. Or the in, pretty much close to the entire existence of the kingdom. And in fact, the British ended slavery, the slave trade in Britain before Dahomey did. And the British actually sent out warships to police the coast to prevent you know, this kingdom from selling off black slaves. And so it's odd that the trailer begins with John Boyega's character saying that the Europeans are coming, which it's a little weird because the image of the Europeans they show, it's, they look like they're from the 18th century, not the 19th century, since colonialism was late 19th century. But he talks about how freedom is at stake and that these powers are coming to take away their freedom. Yet we do have the truth, you know, we do know that this, you know, African kingdom was heavily involved with slavery, keeping slaves, selling them. And so knowing Hollywood, I'm very, right. very interested to see if they're going to even mention that, if this is going to figure into the plot anyway, it's going to be ignored because they see it as a pro-black thing that it's okay to overlook the more negative aspects of Africa then and now because of white people. And we need, you know, blacks to rally around something they can be proud of, which this movie looks to be positioning itself in much in the same way, the marketing for black Panther positioned that movie. Oh, so interesting. First of all, can we just talk about the fact that this African kingdom was called Dahomey? Yes, <laughs> the homie <laughs> <the> clown. <laughs> the, the homie, yeah. Uh, that's just, that's just kind of funny, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking it up right now, and you're right. It's I mean, of course you're right, but it's saying this, this is this is one of the most important things about this kingdom. Yes, yeah, it your economy. That's a yeah. major major thing. And it's not just like a small thing because we're used to historic biopics overlooking like things about certain individuals throughout history, but for entire, you know, civilization to be based on slavery for that to be overlooked, it's going to be interesting. Now, here's the thing. I think there's going to be a coming controversy over this because I noticed in various comment sections, people would bring up the fact that in this kingdom owned slaves. And then someone would reply to that like, Oh, you didn't care about them ignoring history in this movie and this movie and this movie. So I suspect that once this movie comes out and we see the marketing come out, that we're going to see a lot of the kind of mainstream journalists start to point out the uh, movies having to do with the founding fathers or the Revolutionary yeah. War and saying, well, you don't care that they, they own slaves, huh? Huh? What's your problem? So I, I really think this is going to, there's going to be a little bit of controversy. And I think that's going to try to, they're going to try to factor it into the market and get even more buzz around it. Yes, I think you're right. And which is funny because they want to hold us to a new standard and 
they're per- but they're perfectly willing to excuse not living up to their own standard mm-hmm. by saying, but look at the past, mm-hmm. you know, if they don't show that as being a major part, I mean, here, look at this guys. Let me put this on screen for a second. Um, can you see that? Yes. This is from Encyclopedia Britannica. It just says the kingdom is talking about the This is the way you spell it, by the way, not like homie, the clown. <laughs> the, homie, the kingdom was a form of absolute monarchy unique in Africa. The king, surrounded by a magnificent uh, retinue, was the unchallenged pinnacle of a rigidly stratified, uh, stratified society of royalty, commoners, and slaves. He governed through a centralized bureaucracy staffed by commoners who could not threaten his authority. Each male official in the field had a female counterpart at court who monitored his activities and advised the king. Conquered territories were assimilated through intermarriage, uniform laws, and a common tradition of enmity to the Yerbura. Um, Now, this is the very... Dahomey was organized for war, not only to expand its boundaries, but also to take captives as slaves. Slaves were either sold to the Europeans in exchange for weapons or kept to work the royal plantations that supplied food for the army and court. From approximately the year 1680, a regular census of population was taken as a basis for military conscription. Female soldiers, called Amazons by the Europeans, served as royal bodyguards when not in combat. I mean, it's a very interesting society. It's Mm -hmm. what, what a great, what rich material subject matter for a movie. You know, I'm not surprised they're making a movie about this place that I had never heard of. But you're right, if they leave out the main form of commerce and what they're known for, that's going to be glaring, a glaring and purposeful omission. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about this because it kind of uh, similarly reflects my view on Afrofuturism. I have a very mixed feelings about Afrofuturism. You know, it's a very broad definition and I don't know if we want to, do we want to pull up one of the definitions? Um, yeah, let's pull up the definition. Uh, I'm just going to read this quickly so I don't get behind. Matt Decker gave us a super chat. Hello, Matt Decker. The, the behatted Matt Decker. He says, uh, it's clearly about <laughs> colonists introducing <laughs> hat wearing to a backwards culture. <laughs> you all will now be fresh princes. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and I just thought this was funny. Karoi Hemlock says, woman king, otherwise known as a queen. Yeah, and that was the other thing, too, with the name. I was like, um, trying to make some statement. Do they they feel that queens are inferior to kings? So we're just going to kind of like the uh, mother and father stuff. So they're just going to start calling mothers fathers. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) I mean, it's a great name. It's very Mm -hmm. catchy. Yeah, it's it's an interesting name. I'm just – because everything – everything's so politicized now and everything's so ideological. So I can't help but just – look at things and i hope you know i hope that like I'm why did they make that choice but yeah I, I wouldn't be shocked if if they did do that so so which of these would you like me to pull up for the definition the um uh, do you the uh tiltwest.org one yes yeah hold on there we go dun, dun, dun. okay did you do. guys we're not just talking about afrofuturism in film, we're also going to be talking about fashion, and some of it's pretty cool. Like, yes, very- well, that's cool. That's why I'm mixed feelings. So. But it's okay. Can you see that? Uh, there we go. So this is just a short description this person wrote on his little blog thing, and I thought it was pretty good. I was going to read just a couple paragraphs uh, for. Uh, uh, see it, Dias uh, Boric and continental African people, the apocalypse began with the European contact, contact, the transatlantic slave trade and European colonialism, Afrofuturism, a term coined by Mark Derry, which by the way, he's a white guy. Keep that in mind. Mark oh, Derry, a white guy coined it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'll say something about that in a moment. Uh, a term coined by Mark Derry in his 1994 article, Black to the Future. Interviews with Samuel R. Delaney, Greg Tate, 
Trisha Rose emerges as an interdisciplinary and imaginative approach that pan-African writers and visual and performing artists have developed to detox from historical, cultural, social, and political trauma as a, well as a to create a new way to see the world. Jazz musician Sun Ra and leader of the collective Parliament Funkadelic, George Clinton, represent early forms of Afrofuturism expressed through music. A choreographer and author Yatasha Womack uses Afrofuturism to inform contemporary dance and freestyle movement. Award-winning speculative fiction writer Octavia E. Butler was a literary force who insisted upon people of color and gender marginalized people claiming a space in the future. More recently, African and Caribbean artists and writers like Nidi Okafor and Olukian Chelyfiosh and Nalo Hopkinson have demanded that Pan-Africans not forget the motherland, rich in storytelling and mythology, when envisioning the future. And this past February, Afrofuturism captured the national and international imagination with the film Black Panther opened in movie theaters around the world. Afrofuturism as an imaginative artistic movement has uh, syncophic quality. The West African term and symbol you phase emphasize can't read that. Uh, if of this is the power of <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, power of heritage and ancestral connective tissue to ensure that black people can claim an empowered future. At a basic level, it reminds us that in this present moment, humanity must embrace, learn, and heal from the past. Seen through an Afrofuturistic lens, the forthcoming world may be filled with technologically advanced scientific creations, but we must also acknowledge the value of the mind and body, as well as the ancestral world of the unseen in time and space. This is an essential foundation of Black people are to sustain themselves in external and internal environments that have become toxic over time because of the ways that the planet has been exploited and depleted of resources. An Afrofuturistic universe must have a commitment to clean, cleansing the internalized oppression that has originated from one privileged group's innoxious thoughts, behaviors, and desires to exploit people of color, particularly Black people. Can we pause there? Yeah, well, then we're done. <laughs> What? We're done. Yeah. We're done. Okay. That last sentence, come on. It says, <laughs> come on. An Afrofuturistic universe must have a commitment to cleansing the internalized oppression that has originated from one privileged groups. I like how they don't name, they don't say white people. They, like, as if they're being, it's almost like when somebody Ooh, wins this group. Like, yeah, like, well, somebody here owes someone an apology. You know, when they, it's like, just say it, just say it, just say white people you're not being better than or you're not being kind by saying one privileged group <laughs> anyway uh cleansing the internalized oppression that has originated from one privileged group's noxious thoughts behaviors and desires to exploit people of color particularly black people see the other thing about that sentence is they sort of make it uh, they make uh, the the evil of slavery entirely the fault of people of that one race uh, they, they're not even acknowledging that white people have been slaves in history that uh, Indian people have been slaves. all different kinds of people have been slaves it's not like limited to race and and that all different races of people have enslaved I mean that doesn't that doesn't that's not to say that our particular experience with slavery here I feel like I have to explain this if social justice people are watching, <laughs> yeah, right? like, why do you feel that way but I do of course social justice people if you're watching of course what we know the context of slavery in our country yes was white people enslaving black people yes but throughout history to try and like reduce it to that and say it's just that it, 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 it's just not honest I yeah and see this this it, kind of highlights part of my feelings towards Afrofuturism. Like if we're talking about in terms of aesthetics, like seeing more tribal type aesthetics paired up with futuristic technology, if I'm looking at that in the framework of just an art piece, you know, digital concept art or something, I say, cool, that, that I can appreciate that. Now, if I see it in a movie like Black Panther, uh, that's where I start to go, mm, I don't know about that because... With Black Panther, you saw uh, Wakanda, which is the most advanced country in on Earth, 
which hid itself from the rest of the world, and this allowed it to flourish. Even though they're the most advanced country on Earth, they still embrace a lot of more, dare I say, primitive uh, practices and uh, old pieces of technology that they use along new pieces of technology. Like there's scenes where they're throwing spears and I, I almost felt offended <laughs> while I was watching these scenes because they have laser guns, but yet you have soldiers that <laughs> are using to throw spears. They're literally chucking spears. They're <laughs> like, this is expensive. And so they also have practices where like, uh, they're, uh, it's a uh, monarchy and apparently people can challenge the king to a ritual combat. And if they win, and they get to be king apparently or something along those lines. I'm not sure exactly what the rules are, but it seemed very backwards trying to tell a story that, you know, is putting black people in, you know, the future or the present and, and showcasing them in a more advanced state, but yet calling back to a more primitive time. And so I think that what I just mentioned in relation to the ideological component, which I've noticed, I don't know if this was originally intended, certainly I don't think it's as much intended with like Parliament Funkadelic and some of the other artists they named prior to Mark Derry naming uh, Afrofuturism, giving it that name. But this idea that Africa would not be in the state it is now, if not for slavery and colonialism is, is one that I think is based on a very unnuanced view towards slavery and colonialism with slavery something that i learned in recent years that i didn't know about was the fact that blacks owned a lot of other blacks like there are pretty much no europeans that went into africa and captured slaves by themselves because the europeans they didn't have the immune system to really deal with you know the environment in africa many of them would right. die so they relied on black Africans capturing other black Africans and then selling them to the white man. Not only this, but there was also a huge slave trade to the Islamic countries and the Arab countries. And that form of slavery was far more brutal than what the Europeans did. Like one of the reasons why there's not a lot of black people in the Islamic countries right now is because these black slaves were castrated and many of them died after that. And even if they managed to uh, procreate and have children, if th those children were found, they were killed. And so there's, to this day, still a lot of racism in these Islamic countries, which is something I had no idea about prior to a few years ago. Like I've, I've been black for most of my life, <laughs> all my life. And I went to a black church with my parents back when I was living with them in high school. Uh, I, was part of numerous black groups. I took African American studies in college and in none of these settings and these environments did I ever learn about this. And so I, I always look at this belief that, you know, if not for slavery and colonialism, that Africa would be far more prosperous. I, I just, I think that that's a major assumption that assumes that the culture that was stolen from many of these Africans by removing them from you know, Africa was a culture that would have led to a more prosperous environment. I'm not an expert on, you know, Africa or colonialism and any of these things, but I just find that assumption to be the foundation of Afrofuturism, foundation of Black Panther, and so many other stories we see. And I just, I think it's odd that a movement that presents itself being pro-Black or pro-African kind of like a pan-Africanism that's purely so mostly based on an aesthetic version of the idea of African one of uh, it's one that's built on this amalgamation of different aesthetics from different tribes around Africa. This is meant to somehow be a new identity for for us blacks, you know, for you know uh, us blacks living outside of Africa who have very little if no cultural links to Africa. This is something that's meant to empower us, but it's something that's very shallow, something that's built on a very unnuanced, a very black and white view of history. And I think it doesn't serve the purpose that many people state 
when they're putting for it the version of Afrofuturism that talks about colonialism. Because there's there's version of Afrofuturism that's simply just showcasing black people in the future, which yeah, that's great. But if you're coming along with a narrative relating to, you know, whites oppressing blacks, and that's the reason why blacks either here in America or in Africa aren't more progressed, then I think that's something that's very misleading and something that's very damaging actually to a lot of people. Wow. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a lot, but I, I think yeah. I, I think I agree with most of that. I would just say uh, it includes a lot of assumptions. That's sort of what you're saying. Yeah. That the, that the culture would, if not for, <clears throat> if not for European colonialists, that somehow uh, we know what the future would have held if that hadn't happened, but we don't. Yeah. Um. I don't know. It, there's also something you said about the aesthetics of it. It seems like it's an aesthetic movement, which that part of culture, we, we, we've talked before about how when people talk about culture, you almost have to ask them, what are they talking about? Because there's the, there are parts of culture, which I think, I think uh, it's possible to, to appreciate and, or the, the, the social justice people would say appropriate, but to appreciate the parts of culture that have to do with the arts, like, music, dance, um, literature, food, um, dress, fashion, those kind of things. But then there's the parts of culture that are much more important. Like what ideas does your culture hold um, to be important? And, and, what, what, and, and those are not always, I think when leftists say, you know, we need to embrace all cultures, all cultures are equally valid. It's sort of like, yeah, what are you talking about? Are you talking about all all you know it's it's possible to have an appreciation for all different kinds of foods yes absolutely or music sure but to say that we have to have an equal appreciation for all cultural values or ideas about what's acceptable no i don't think so but i think they kind of blend these things together even in this essay this is why i left it up they're sort of they're talking about afrofuturism which if it's just an aesthetic and we're going to show you guys some of the fashion and stuff I think that's cool. I think that's artistic. I think it's, if, if somebody were to say, you know, what do you think of Afro, Afrofuturistic fashion? I'd be like, there's some really cool looks coming out of it. Like, and I like that it draws on all these different tribes from Africa in the past and stuff. And it has this futuristic element. Or if you're talking about music that I can have an appreciation for that. But then if you start adding in all of this importance um, and this moralizing, like they're doing in this article where they're saying, Afrofuturism, it's not just an artistic movement. Okay, imagine if artistic movement up there. It's not just an artistic movement. It's, uh, it says it's, it's going to offer us a rich vision of the future that could push humanity to a more fulfilling level of development and ensure humanity's existence beyond the dystopic present in which we live. That's very weighty for, you know, a new form of clothing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> and the thing is like like you said a lot of the fashion looks cool but it's odd when you think about it being a mix of various types of aesthetics from all over africa so africa is a giant ass continent you know there's over 50 countries a billion people it's gonna be a lot of different cultures and tribes and things and so it's weird you think about how there's no, or say very little opposition to uh, this amalgamation when say, if you were to do this for, I don't know, Asia, like if you were to have a fictional Asian country that mixed Japanese, Chinese, Korea, Vietnamese, Thai fashion aesthetics together, I think you would see a lot of opposition to that, especially in those countries, because many of those countries are very proud in their country they're very nationalistic, very proud in their tribe, and many of them hate <laughs> the other Asian countries. And so it's odd to me how a lot of us Blacks will just accept this mixing of these, you know, shallow their versions of these ancient cultures together and accept this as some empowering identity that we can all adapt, which to me, I, I'm prone to conspiracy thinking, but to me, it seems like maybe the more globalist type forces kind of push that, you know, to, to foster identity amongst all of us 
uh, blacks who live outside of Africa and to get us to adapt this kind of black nationalism and, and particularly because it has that uh, narrative about whites oppressing us. Yes. Globe. You just hit the nail on the head because this isn't something that's coming from Africans actually. Um, and as you said, the toy, the, the term Afrofuturism was coined by a white guy. And the thing about, I, I'm not an expert on Africa either, oh, believe it or not. <laughs> but uh, I lived, when I lived in Tanzania, this is my only experience with, is with one little country. The Africans had a real, um, how, how would I phrase this? They were almost harder on the uh, black American students who came over than they were on the white students because they didn't see them as African. And they almost had a, a resentment towards them that they, some people did, that they didn't have towards the white students. And yep. this sort of, uh, you have a responsibility. They, they would ask my friend why she didn't speak Swahili. And, you know, and, and it didn't help that there were two of us in the group who had taken Swahili and we weren't, and we were white. And it was sort of like, well, why don't you care enough? It's, it was this expectation and this, uh, uh, I was thinking like, gosh, that would be hard, harder. You know, they're not treating her the same way. It was almost with a bit of disdain. Um, and I think what you're saying is true is that I, I wonder how Africans feel about this sort of uh, pan-Africanism where you're taking all the different tribal, like cultural languages and foods and all the different ways of dressing and, and everything and putting it all together and saying, this is African, right? For Americans. Yeah, a lot of Africans don't like us Blacks. And I always found it odd how much many of us Blacks in America romanticize, you know, the more tribal aspects of Africa. Many of us, you know, pro-Black types will don dashikis and kente cloths, and some people even change their name, which sometimes they'll, they'll even come Muslim, which is odd because a lot of times they reject Christianity simply because they believe that's a religion forced on black people by white people. But yet Islam was forced upon blacks by Muslims. But anyway, that's weird. But it's just, it's, it's odd to me, this kind of fixation with, you know, Africa in terms of solely the aesthetics and not really trying to understand the practices and the values of these various groups in, in, in Africa. And it's just, it, it's, I could understand it in the context of, say, the 1960s or 1950s, where, you know, a lot of Blacks, you know, living under Jim Crow were very disillusioned with America and with, you know, so-called American values because they didn't see these American values being applied to them as it was applied to other people. Right. But in the context now where us Blacks have a ridiculous more amount of opportunities that our ancestors couldn't even dream about it's odd to me people who who still want to to harken back to to what they believe to be ancient Africa and form an identity based on that when they really have no links other than being descended of someone from the, that from a long that's long such time. That's a great point. It's like creating a new identity and, and culture that's not actually African. Mm -hmm. um, almost like Kwanzaa, which we're told is an African holiday, but it's really just I mean, it was created by an American. <laughs> by the way, <laughs> when I was in sixth grade, I had a history teacher that uh, asked me to explain to the class uh, why I celebrated Kwanzaa. What? Like, <laughs> Kwanzaa. <laughs> She's like, Talk to the class about Kwanzaa. She like, just assumed you celebrate Kwanzaa? Yeah. And, and uh, you do, of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I sacrifice goats. On, yeah. <laughs> Did I ever tell you my Kwanzaa story? No. Ah, oh, people, some people in the chat, if you've been around for a while, you probably already know this. I'll make it short. When I worked in comedy, one of my, when I worked for, um, uh, the, it was, it, it, I was working for a different comedy manager. It was before I had my own company. And she was a, an older, white, very woke woman. And she always did these really uncomfortable things. Like I remember we're on an elevator and, um, our, our client who was an Asian woman. And then there was a black person who got on. And after we got off, she said something to me about like, I just wish they knew I was one of them. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, she's just awkward. And uh, anyway, 
at the end of the year for a company party, instead of throwing a Christmas party, she threw a Kwanzaa party and she had wrapped herself in kente cloth, this very wealthy, privileged white lady and a, <laughs> and a head wrap. And everyone showed up and had to participate. And uh, it, while she made us, the, there, she had games where we had to count how many beans were in a jar and all these other Kwanzaa games that she had found on the internet. And it was just like, you're trying too hard. What are you doing? <laughs> Um, one of the comedians that she managed was a black guy. And I, I think, I think it probably was like your moment of the teacher asking you to explain Kwanzaa to the class is sort of like, Oh gosh, don't look at me. This isn't my <laughs> holiday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Very cringe. Anyway. Can we pull um, up uh, the second article I sent you? I just want to read a couple paragraphs from it. This is the Nicholas, Selnik and the Medium article. Oh, the Medium one. Yeah, I've got this one right here. This is the Afrofuturism decolonizing the imagination. Yes. Okay. Boom. No, let's see. I'm going to scroll down. And, and right before you start reading this, let me just read this off. Thank you for the super chats, guys. Jillian. Jillian says, for the laugh uh, that the Dahomey comment gave me, I love this show. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then just a couple of comments. Uh, Kevin Anderson says, no, they're not. All cultures are not created equally. I agree. Um, and then this is for you, Mr. Chris, because I don't know what this means. You want to read it? <laughs> so we're not talking about Ben Cisco shaving his head and growing a beard after season one of Deep Space Nine. It's a Star Trek reference. I knew I knew that it was Star Trek. That's yeah. why I picked that for you. <laughs> uh, Adam says, "Yeah, the left and BLMers use the Pan African flag in their protests." I didn't know that. And Kevin says, "Kevin Anderson says, did Richard Pryor have a routine about going back to the motherland?" And after a month or so there, he realized he had absolutely nothing in common with Africans. Do you remember that? Uh, I don't. I don't think I've seen that. I'll have to look that up after the show. I, I, <laughs> I remember back in high school, I used to joke around. I would say, uh, slavery is bad and all, but I'm glad to be in America. And then I saw Patrice O'Neill make a similar joke. And I was like, I felt validated. I'm like, Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know who else has a joke like that? Yeah. Louis C.K. Oh, does he? Okay. He has a whole routine about um, about the positive things that have come from bad things, mm -hmm. and he just sets up a bunch of things like that. You know, like I know that slavery was bad, but he just yeah. says a lot of offensive things. Like, anyway, that's really funny. I have to look up the Patrice joke. Okay, but okay, so I want to skip on down. If you go down to the paragraph right under the picture of the uh, black man with the star on his chest. Yeah, there we go. So I'm going to read that, uh, actually the paragraph right under, there we go. The, so this, uh, the italicized quote uh, by Mark Derry, who, uh, as we mentioned earlier, is a white guy, which in doing some research for the show, I did see some articles of people who were rejecting, like Afrofuturists who were rejecting the term Afrofuturism because it was coined by a white man. Like it was, a, they were like, no, I'm not gonna use that term because it came from a white man. So they came up with some other term. I was like, that's funny. But uh, so Mark Derry says, I theorized Afrofuturism at a time when I was witnessing the creation of ideologies that would put the mass imagination in a straitjacket for decades to come. Mark Derry told me in an interview for French media, Uzbek and Rika. That was in 1993, before the web really existed. Already you could see the first uh, faltering steps of the white geek elite that Wired Magazine was dubbing as the new myth makers, the evangelists of the gospel of technological progress and the utopian of possibilities of Silicon Valley. I realized that all of Wired's covers showed white geeky guys, and when they put a black one on the front page, it was to talk about gangs in cyberspace. And then I'm going to skip down to the uh, section that starts with Black Panther, Mainstream Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. There we go. 
So Black Panther, mainstream Afrofuturism, to fight in the realm of imagination, the Aurelian tipex of revisionism, which we see in 1984 lacks subtlety. The point is not to deconstruct everything. The images are there. You have to live with them, argues uh, Mawina Yahushi, the artist behind the Blacks to the Future project. On the other hand, it is possible to superimpose other images on them, to hack or reconfigure them. We can have, with these images, a more horizontal relationship. We can be negotiating with them, which is something. But the struggle is being fought with more or less finance. The year 2018 marked a new, major new turning point in the history of Afrofuturism, thanks to the theoretical or the, theatrical release of Marvel's Black Panther's uh, blockbuster, adapted from Jack Kirby's comic book. Afrofuturism reaches mass culture, a worldwide success, a casting and production team almost exclusively of Afro-descendant. All in one, it is already a step forward, but when Black Panther could be, have brought the fundamental concepts of Afrofuturism into the public debate, the blockbuster was above all rather disappointing recycling of a trend that was becoming fashionable. The film was finally quite Manchian, with stereotypical characters cleared of any radical discourse. In a review written for the Boston Review, academic Christopher LeBon points out where the problem lies. He says, Black Panther presents itself as the most radical Black experience of the year. We are meant to feel emboldened by the images of T'Challa, a Black man clad in powerful combat suit, tearing up the bad guys that threaten good people. But the lessons I learned were these. The bad guy is the Black American who has rightly identified white supremacy as the reigning threat to the Black well-being. The Black guy is the one who thinks Wakanda is being selfish in its secret liberation. The black guy is the one who will no longer stand for patience and moderation. He thinks liberation is many, many decades overdue, and the black hero snuffs him out. And so this was another issue that came up with Black Panther, because Wakanda essentially is established as being an ethnostate. It's all blacks. They're shut off from the rest of the world. They have like a... The more advanced parts are invisible, but the parts that they want the world to see are all dilapidated and third world looking. But in the movie, the bad guy who is the cousin of the main character uh, believes that the world is being suppressed. He doesn't say white people, it's being suppressed by white people, but it's kind of implied that he believes that. And he believes that Wakanda needs to open itself up to all blacks everywhere and spread its technology. And so they can all rise up and, you know, kick out black people, black and white people, whoever it was. And so a lot of people, it was funny, particularly like uh, I saw some people on the right uh, mentioning, laughing that the fact that Disney would put in a story about an ethno state that is prospering <laughs> because it's isolated from the rest of the world and that the main guy is a black liberationist who wants to spread, you know, some... Uh, Pan African ideology to the rest of the world. So, yeah, Alan says Wakanda is nationalist. Yeah, I that those were some of the reviews I read talking about how uh, some conservatives actually really liked the. the they <laughs> said it was a, a nationalist sort of conservative vision. Which did you view it that way at all? I didn't view it as that. I mean. I suppose if you want to look at it with the ethno state and the monarchy, because I do know there's a sect of conservatives that do believe in monarchy. Hmm. Um, just one point, John Miller says, quote, how they were bragging in that piece, he, quote, almost exclusively Afro-descendant. And then he says, so inclusive, so diverse, so brave. It's a great point. They, they want to call um, having exclusively a black staff or cast or uh you know staff at a company or something they want to call that diverse when it's pointedly not it's <laughs> it's the opposite of diversity but it's what's so frustrating it's just the surface level diversity it doesn't talk anything about you know the beliefs the values uh you know the interest of the individual because you're just judging them based on their look and just assuming that they all share the same beliefs yeah it's very well, that's what they do. That's just like your teachers assume that you celebrate Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so insult. It's so condescending. 
But when I went to the dentist as a kid and he asked me, I played basketball, I had to say, yes, <laughs> play basketball. I'm like, damn it. Yes. I remember one time we were at a party and you said there was, there was some fried chicken there and you were like, I really would like to eat the fried chicken first, but I also don't want to because I don't want to be a stereotype. <laughs> yeah. I wanted that. <laughs> Good. Because I work. It was in the lunchroom. There was all white people in there. And it was like one piece of chicken. And I didn't want them to see a black man going straight through the fried chicken. So I was like, oh, damn it. I guess I have to pretend I want some pizza right now. And then I was like, oh, that's just, that's some chicken. And I was, you know, I might as well. Last piece. I'll take it. <laughs> you're so funny. <laughs> I can't, sometimes I can't tell because your sense of humor is just, you have a great sense of humor. And sometimes you get me and I'm like, is he being serious? Does he really, <laughs> does he really care what they think? Like, <laughs> I, I love messing with people. Like I, I told people uh, my views on gentrification, where I say that white people need to stop being demonized for gentrifying these black areas because they're making it safe for the rest of us. They're taking the risk of getting their crap stolen. And so instead of demonizing these brave white souls, we need to celebrate them. And I came up with an award called the Lewis and Clark Award to be given to these brave white souls as they venture into these dark, dark jungles. Guys, this is really, these are really the things that, that Mystery Chris says in mixed company at parties in front of sometimes woke white people. And mm -hmm. then everyone's quiet and you just wait to see how they react. Yeah, they don't know. <laughs> 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 they always look at me so weird. They're like, oh, I don't know. They're so confused. <laughs> They're so confused. That's not come cute. That's not come uh, cute. What? <laughs> Adam says he has a dry sense of humor. He's, Chris speaks my language. Yes. Thank you, Adam. So funny. Um, okay. So what do you want to look at next? I ha I'll tell you what I have queued up. I have some fashion. I yeah. have a, a, actually, it's that New York Times piece that we didn't think we could open. I do have that one queued up. Um, and I have an Instagram full of Afro-futuristic fashion. Yeah, let's take a look. I'm going to look at that. Okay. Yeah. This is some of the fun parts. Let's see. It's not like I'm particularly into fashion. I just like to see. I like. I appreciate beautiful things. Yeah, I'm not into fashion either. But, you know, I was looking up Afrofuturism. I was looking at some of the fashion stuff. I was like, well, that's really unique. Kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Even a rube like me can appreciate it. Okay. Michael Jackson's Afrofusionist. Yeah. So they're saying this isn't, this is sort of what you were telling me before we started the video about how they're going back now in time and they're claiming things for Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. Octavia Butler, the, the black sci-fi writer. Um, that's a, yeah, that's a really cool look. Um it is sort of this mix of things. See, now this, no. <laughs> no, sorry. Is that sorry. a quote red? <laughs> and those baskets, those ba can, can, you know what I'd like to see? This right here, this part looks like a watering can. Like he's going to go, you're going to turn this guy over like a, a pot of tea and pour <laughs> some tea. This is my handle. This is my spout. Um, but I would like to see this this person wear this outfit in Tanzania. <laughs> <laughs> and see what happens. Burn her. Burn her. <laughs> this is pretty cool. I is like this Grace look. Jones? Who is that? Is that just a person that looks like it's Grace, Grace Jones. It is Grace Jones. Yeah, I did yeah. reach she's also considered Afrofuturist. Okay. I mean, there's some cool <laughs> looks on here. It's like you see like all these images of like Afrofuturist fashion and then there's like randomly a picture of like a giraffe or a yeah like what you're like what is that <laughs> uh okay just give people some ideas here's one I mean I love that I think that's great but this is not again this is the aesthetic part of what they're calling this new culture of, right. of Afrofuturism how, how is this supposed to, would they say, you know, subvert the years of patriarchal white oppression and, and point us towards a better future? And it's like, it's just, it's just an aesthetic, guys. Like, why are you putting so much? Black weight? people have to look more fabulous than white people. That's how we'll defeat white supremacy. 
I will say you looked pretty fabulous at my wedding. You really classed it up. Well, thank you. Yeah. This is this is this one's kind of fun. I like this one too. Okay. That's weird. Is that that's enough of the art? Uh if we did you have another link? I have one. I just want to I do. So this is a New York Times piece, and this one's about music. And we're going to pull up the failing New York Times. <laughs> I feel so dirty when I click on a New York Times article. I, I hear you. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, this one I just wanted to show for the, the images. So I think that's is that Janelle Monet. I think yes. that's looks like her. Yeah. So she's considered Afrofuturist. And I don't listen to a lot of her no. music. I do. What? Who's the racist now? That's Blanche <laughs> Knowles. Who is the racist now? <laughs> well, she stole her look. So uh. <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut you off. No, no. <laughs> no. That was it. But yeah, that's, that's interesting. So it says in the September issue of W Magazine, Rihanna was cast as Tomorrow, an otherworldly warrior queen and champion of the downtrodden, resplendent in diamonds and foil. By the way, this is a piece from 2016. So this is, they've been talking about Afrofuturism for longer than I realized. A month earlier at the MTV Video Music Awards, Beyonce projected a similarly astral vibe. Flanked on the stage by twin columns of attendants, she was a galactic goddess in a white ermine cape. In November on Silent Life, her sister Solange Knowles flaunted a sundial size headdress of crystals and tight woven braids, looking every inch a regal visitor from a distant planet. Each was in her way a beacon of Afrofuturism, a social, political, and cultural genre that projects black space voyagers, warriors, and their heroic like into a fantasy landscape, one that has long been the province of their mostly white counterparts. See, but th this is the weird thing. There's nothing called like white white futurism <laughs> that's about like that that claims to be a social, political, and cultural genre. Like I don't. It's so broad. It's like they're just like throwing as much stuff as they can into this to make it like a movement, much bigger than it actually is. Yeah, I, I don't really get how they're trying to tie it all together. Is right. Not just a genre, but I think they're trying to maybe push it as a as an identity, as you were saying. Yeah, that's the only thing that makes sense is that, you know, like I said, it's that accompanying narrative about, you know, oppression that goes along with it and showing a vision of the future that was robbed from us Black people, according to that narrative. Mm. Familiar to some, exotic to others, the term loosely re refers to an unlikely fusion of parts, Egyptian and other non-Western mythologies, mysticism and magical realism with Afrocentricity, modern technology and science fiction. A freighted concept in more ways than one, it gained traction this year, 2016, muscling its way into the pop cultural mainstream via the intertwined worlds of entertainment, art and style. And then they have a picture of Rihanna in the, the futuristic, the Afrofuturistic attire. In part, Afrofuturism, an aesthetic dating roughly from the 1970s, has taken on a new public face through a new generation of recording artists like Erica Baidu, Missy Elliott, and Janelle Monet, among them, who have given it not only a voice, but also a look. You will likely know it when you see it. A high shine mashup of cyborg themes, loosely tribal motifs, android imagery, and gleaming metallics that might be appropriate for a voyage to Pluto's outer reaches. Again, this is all about art and aesthetic. How is it a political movement? They say it's also a social and political movement up here. Social, political, and cultural. Okay, well, we see the cultural. It's it's art. It's music. It's a look. It's an aesthetic. And how is Missy Elliott Afrofuturist? She's wearing a trash bag. <laughs> it's What's that thing about black people. <laughs> Do you remember? Okay, do you remember the OJs had that song that got remade um, by Heavy D? Do you remember the video where they're all wearing these big, almost trash bag sized, different colored raincoats? Yes. yes. What is that song? Anyway, this th that was sort of trash bag fashion. That was happening in the 80s. 
<laughs> okay, let's put it right here. Like, is that not blackface? Yeah, that's kind of blackface. Well, I mean, it's artistic. Empowering. Uh, it says it's Less light skinned black woman, but it's a queenly self portrait with a futuristic edge, is what they say. In black, in black, in a black mask. Yeah, it's, it is interesting. I mean, Smart, but yeah. again, where is this? This is all the aesthetic. This is all how is this a social and a political movement? I have no idea. And then if you scroll through, they never really get to that. It's all about, it's all about, and then at the end, listen to our Afrofuturism playlist. Now you get to listen to music. <laughs> they don't tell you anything about how this has anything to do with the kind of culture that has to do with ideas, values, mm -hmm. transforming the future in important ways other than just through fashion and music. So I, I still, I guess I'm a little confused on how they claim it's, it's all of that stuff and not just a cool artistic you know look yeah that doesn't really that doesn't really drive uh i did have uh one article and this is just i just want to show it for the pictures uh the dizen 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 i guess that's how you pronounce it dot com article okay i got it d's what i'm kidding <laughs> so this article is just showing some uh pictures of work by artists and designers and some of it really weird other stuff is kind of cool but like this is weird like if this was a parliament funkadelic show i'm like oh that's that's, that's cool but Outside of the context, like that's weird. Th this one, that building is by an architect who's considered an Afrofuturist, which it, it, I guess it also applies to architecture. Which, I mean, at least, you know, you're building something functional with that, I guess. And then there's just more fashion design stuff. Uh, there's art piece. Uh, uh, this is Afrocentricism? This yeah. painted furniture? Oh. What? No. I, I no. That that's like the one thing that what which of these things does not belong? This. <laughs> well, it says he referenced fabrics from a Nigerian culture or something. So oh, that's stupid. Nigerian heritage somehow. <laughs> and then there, it's an interesting looking floating house. Another architect. Okay. Nigerian architect. That's pretty cool. Uh, it's bad mm -hmm. concept art there. Mm. And a refrigerator, <laughs> African refrigerator. And then what is this? An artist in Kenya specializes in creating new objects from waste. Again, we're talking about art, more fashion. And see, and this this highlights. And we're going to do a show on, on modern art, but this just kind of highlights the. Um, foisting upon art, you know, textual relevancy where they describe what this art piece is supposed to mean. And then you look at it with that framework and go, oh, okay, I guess I kind of see it now. It's like art that couldn't exist outside of any kind of textual framework that tells you what it is. It's like showing someone a Rorschach, but telling them what, what it is. is. And they're like, oh yeah, I guess, I guess that is a foot. I, I can't, I can't stand that like modern or postmodern people, people correct me that sometimes when I talk about postmodern art, they said, no, Carrie, you're talking about modern art. I don't know. They both suck um, for the most part, in my opinion. I, I used to be one of those people who, did you ever, did were you ever one of those people who would go to an art museum and, and you would allow them to convince you that you just weren't cultured enough to understand, understand it? No. Because I, I, I have an art background, and so I, I've always hated that uh, art that essentially acted as a inside joke, where you, yeah. you need a wall, of, a whole paragraph of text put up on the wall in order to understand. To explain what you're it. It's so yeah. pretentious and like full of itself. One that I saw, one of the last museums I went to, 
before I left California, I went to a museum where they had an exhibit and it was, it was a, a woman. Her art consisted of taking stuffed animals and pulling the stuffing out and putting them on pedestals <laughs> and then had a wall of text about what it symbolized. And, and I was just kind of like, mm, being a psychopath. I think this is garbage. <laughs> uh, I had a couple um, articles that just showed a tw t tweet. There's a tweet in each article, and they're kind of funny uh, related to Black Panther. Okay. And so um, the first one, did I put both? I may have put one of them in there. I think the Yellow Hammer News. I think that's the. Oh, no. I hold on. It. Let me put in the other one first. Uh, give me one moment while I. Oh, you're adding it to the private chat? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if that's it. Oh, I hope that's the right one. Uh, if this is the right one. I have the yellow hammer news one. Okay, let's see. Hold on, let me make sure. I'm not, I'll put this in chat. I don't even know if it's the right link. Uh, it doesn't look like it, but maybe it is. Uh, that's not, I don't think that's it's not right. it. No. Student the, loan debt is being erased. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, let's just show the, the, the other one. I have. Okay. Here we uh, go. I'll, guys. I'll the other one. Uh, I'll read this one. You can find the other one. Yellowhammer. Ridiculous Black Panther tweet shows how divided we've become, how far we'll go not to offend. Uh, on Monday, the founder of the Planetary Society, Emily Lakdawala, sent out a tweet that caused a great deal of controversy. She stated that she did not buy tickets for the opening night of Black Panther because, quote, she did not want to be the white person sucking black joy out of the theater, In quote. I remember this. <laughs> this is her tweet. This woman is serious. I know woke white women like this. Ah, oh, she says, so I carefully did not buy. First of all, this tweet is so self-congratulatory while at the same time <laughs> being subservient and deferring. Is it? I, so I carefully did not buy Black Panther tickets for opening weekend because I did not want to be the white person sucking black joy out of the theater. What's the appropriate date for me to buy tickets? Is it is next weekend okay? <laughs> <sighs> After posting her dim-witted tweet, users started responding to Lakdawala. Some people agreed, while other some people agreed. <laughs> yeah, white lady, I'm glad you didn't come to suck our joy out of the theater. Some people agree while others railed against like Davila's comments, calling her foolish. She later deleted the tweet and sent out another tweet informing her followers that she had to exercise the block button a lot. Quote, it's been a kind of challenging day where I've had to exercise the block button a lot, but I've also had inspiring conversations with people who are committed to changing the world for the better and who gave me strength and confidence. Me, 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 me. <laughs> <laughs> this is beyond ludicrous and is a sure sign that we're becoming more and more divided. No one should feel that they cannot see a movie in fear of being the only white person, black person, or Hispanic person. If you are excited to see a sure to be blockbuster hit, buy tickets and see the damn thing. The left wing narrative that certain individuals should shape and alter their lifestyles based solely upon movies, plays, songs, or any other art form is beyond disgusting. Who wrote this? I really like them. I don't know. I've not heard of his website. Yeah, me either. Uh, Kyle Morris. Good job, Kyle. Anyway, he's just taking her to tap. Did you want me to read more of this or it was just the silly tweet? Uh, no, that's it. I just want to show that ridiculous tweet. Do you know what this makes me think of in Woke is the paper clips thing, the safety pin thing, sorry, where after Trump won, all these articles were published where they said white people needed to wear safety pins to show they're an ally to all these different marginalized groups that were, I guess, going to be rounded up and put into camps under Trump, supposedly. And all these white people did start wearing safety pins. And then, then a whole new round of articles came out that were really uh, disdainful and said things like, you know, white people quit, quit wearing your safety pins. You're just trying to be a good white person. And so then I, I saw white women in, in some of my social justice groups who were coming in, wringing their hands. Like, Oh, you know, Black, should I wear the safety pen? Should I not? Black women, can you weigh in? And it's just absurd. It's That was one of the many things that caused me to start to wake up because I thought, it's so crazy. You're waiting for somebody to tell you how to be a good person? What is wrong with you? And you think that it hinges on whether or not you wear a safety pen? <laughs> so stupid. That's this woman here. 
I didn't go opening weekend because I wanted to be a good white person. And, and we're so awful. If I had been there, I would have sucked the joy out of the room with all of you black people. And I know that I need to come in. Oh, shut up. She just assumes that it's all black people too. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure there wasn't any non-black people watching that movie in the theater. I apologize for ranting on that. I just, that's everything that's wrong with social justice because they have all these high minded faux intellectual platitudes about what it's supposed to be and how it's supposed to be ending racism and stuff. But it doesn't matter what they say it's about. You can see what it's about in that woman's tweet. It trickles down. And when it comes out in behavior, it comes out in really gross ways like that, where now, white people are treating black people differently. Yeah. They're tre- they, they've they been taught. You can see, you can see what that ideology is about in a dumb tweet like that, which is I've got to treat you black people differently. It's a black movie. I got to treat it differently. I can't treat it like any other movie I'd want to see. I have to, and, and I have to announce so I can get kudos. Exactly. In this ideology. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> uh, well, here's another ridiculous uh, controversy. I put the article in. <laughs> Alice says, I think she sucks the joy out of a lot of rooms. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you put it in the private? Yes, cosmopolitan. Got com. it. Put that. Is this Can one going to also be upsetting? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Don't be okay. <laughs> Forever twenty one apologized for using a white model to sell a Black Panther sweater. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is why the Babylon Bee had to do another site called Not the Bee. <laughs> stuff like this is real. <laughs> oh, look at this sub headline. Yes. We celebrate all superheroes with many different models of various ethnicities. Oh, so they have a white guy here wearing a pretty cool, like one of these sort of uh, trendy, ugly Christmas sweaters. And it says Wakanda forever. And then they have a black woman who looks really upset and is giving him this side eye. Hmm? I think it's Angela Bassett. Angela Bassett is giving him the side eye for wearing. How dare he support Black Panther as a white person? (laughs) (laughs) How dare he be excited about this film and buy the merchandise and wear it? How dare he wear a pro-black sweater that was made in China? Right. And wasn't even... Where are my knitters at? This probably... This wasn't even hand-knit, right? (laughs) Way in. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. There's no doubt that Marvel's Black Panther, the second mainstream superhero movie featuring a black hero... Is it only the second? Second superhero? Wait, Marvel... The second mainstream superhero movie featuring a black hero. What was their definition of mainstream? Yeah, because we named like three, four. Uh, Anyway, was uh, that that it was monumental for black America and was a celebration of black excellence. So when Forever 21 decided to use a white model to sell a Wakanda Forever sweater, people were understandably upset. Again, look at this. The news, this is the thing with the media. They tell you how to feel. These people were understandably upset. They want us to know they're about to tell us about people being upset and we should be understanding about it. Here's a photo of the model wearing a sweater with a slogan for the fictional sub-Saharan African country of Wakanda, the home of the Black Panther. It's okay. even more funny. It's not even a real country. <laughs> they're getting upset about fictional country that was invented by a white guy or was Jack Kirby Jewish anyway. It's just... it's. After the company tweeted a link with a picture of the model, Twitter was quick to tell them it was incredibly tone deaf. And then there's just this series of people getting very upset and talking about oh, the tone deaf, just in case they try to delete it. What bullshit is this? Um, and then it says Forever 21 clearly heard about the controversy because it has since issued an apology. Why do they take this stuff seriously? I don't know. <laughs> As the clothing company of your high school days removed the photo from its site, it issued a statement to The Hollywood Reporter. The brand said, Forever 21 takes feedback on our products and marketing extremely seriously. We celebrate all superheroes with many different models of various ethnicities and apologize if the photo in question was offensive in any way. 
It's just it's so crazy just how racist people are. Like, no, you can't wear that shit. That's ours. Like you have segregation of clothing now. Yes. It's like <laughs> you can't wear that. I have to wear this. You have to wear that. It's, this is also it's sort of uh this is that thing that happens a lot with um social justice in the arts is is where you you can't win so if you don't like and you don't go and support th what they're calling only only the second ever superhero movie with a black hero uh if you don't go and support that and you're a white person then you're racist um you're not supporting black film and diverse film right but if you go and support it and like it so much that you buy the merchandise and wear it, then you're somehow appropriating or being offensive because it should have, it should be a black person featured wearing it. And we don't want white people to get the wrong idea that they might want to buy this and wear it and enjoy the culture yeah. of the film as well. Yeah. It, it should be a good thing that, you know, white people want to enjoy, you know, even though I don't consider this part of black culture, quote unquote, black culture, but Hey, if you consider that, then isn't that a good thing that white people want to be a part of that? And they're more accepting of right. that. Because it, it, it's funny, I around the time Black Panther came out, I went to a local comic book shop and they had a Black Panther night and they had like people who were like sword fighting. They had these dancers who were, you know, dressed dress as traditional African tribal garb and they're doing these tribal dances. And I noticed there was a little white boy who was I don't know, probably about seven, wearing a Black Panther costume. And it was interesting because I'd never seen, you know, white kids dressed up as any kind of black superheroes ever. You know, when I was a kid, I dressed as plenty of white superheroes and black superheroes, but I never seen white people do that. And I was like, hey, that's that's kind of nice. It's, you know, showing they're accepting of, like I was yeah. saying earlier, unquote, black culture. But I was thinking if this was on, Twitter right now, there would be so many people who would be wishing practically deaf on this kid. Yeah. Yeah. He can't win. Mm -hmm. They don't, they're, they're just, they're constantly looking for offense. Matt Decker wanted you to know, by the way, that he says the black model refused to wear the sweater. Yeah. I'm <laughs> That's too, too tech. I mean, come on. And Sonora, hello, Sonora. He says Blade one and two were friggin' awesome. And they didn't and never pandered to this nonsense. Blade was just a badass. Mm hmm Yeah, Blade movies are great. The first two, not the third one. Yeah, let's not talk about the third one. Oh, okay. Do we have some something fun to end on after those annoying yeah. tweets? A, a video. It's not a funny video. It's just a fun video. If you want to show that. It's the YouTube one I put in there. This is, is this a, The Joy a of Togetherness? Yes, this is a viral video. Went viral, I don't know, three or four years ago. And it's just uh, two people dancing. It's fun. It's feel good. Good. Let's end with something cool after seeing that people were upset that a white person wore a Wakanda shirt. <laughs> after seeing that tacky sweater. Mm. <laughs> She's really good. Yeah. She's like poor. I mean, he is too. <laughs> You know, he's really <laughs> <laughs> That's a loop now. But yeah, there's a bunch of other videos uh, by it's like the same group, and it's like her dancing with villagers and stuff. It's really cool. That is very cool. And I noticed they had to turn off the comments because I think a while when I first found the video, I was reading some of the comments, and a lot of them positive. But of course, you have people like, oh, that white colonizer dance with those black people you know really? yeah 
People no, have to spoil no joy it. This. No joy. They're joy thieves. They want to eat your joy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Don't listen to those people. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Find a black yeah. person or a white person if you're black and just dance with them. Just dance with them. I mean, you know that dance, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I, 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 I wish I could like dance. I can do like simple dances, but like everyone expects me like really know how to dance. So I was at a party in high school and like my friends were like, hey, Chris is dancing. Everyone come into this room and everyone's staring at me. I was like, uh, uh no, that that reminds me of a comment that went by earlier. Uh, two sisters in some yarn who's helping us out moderating tonight. Thank you, lady. She says, Chris, I always got asked about basketball, too, because I'm freakishly tall. Yeah, people make assumptions based on stereotypes. Which they make assumptions. And then Kevin Anderson says, I'm here to tell y'all that Ethiopian food is the bomb. Seriously, it is. Car Carrie, I had, I had Ethiopian food once, but here's the thing. I've been, three people have told me in my lifetime that I look like I'm Ethiopian. And one of those times was at an Ethiopian restaurant by a waitress who was from Ethiopia. Now, oh. the first time a white lady asked me that, she's like, where are you from? I was like, Houston. And she's like, no, no, where are you from? Like, you know, country, you're sitting It's like, what? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. What the hell are you asking me? Get on my face. But yeah, three times, Carrie. So I think I must be Ethiopian. Do you think so? Have you ever considered doing one of those, uh, like finding your roots? Hen is it Henry Louis Gates that does that show? Uh, one of them, Twenty Three and Me type things. Yeah, have you ever considered doing that? I think my parents did it. I forget what the results were. I don't know if I trust those sites. Yeah, I did. I did Twenty Three and Me before I became skeptical when I was still sort of in asleep. <laughs> I kind of regret giving them. My DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a bunch of carry clones out there, but hey, that could be a good thing. Right. <laughs> right. But you know, it was interesting, and and uh, I've considered doing it with Tiger. I don't care if they have Tiger's DNA. <laughs> <laughs> tiger blood. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to find out what kind of dog he is. People always ask me. But they, so they have them for dogs. They do have them for dogs. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know if he's worth paying that much money for, to be honest. <laughs> it's like, Tiger, do we really sure. know? Yeah. <laughs> it's almost better if he's a he's a dog of mystery. <clears throat> uh, well, thank you for, thank you for the topic. Thanks for walking me through this. I did not know about a lot of this. It's funny to me that they've incorporated George Clinton and the P-Funk All-Stars into this now. I guess I can kind of see them wanting to claim that. Um, <laughs> they're awesome because they are awesome yeah great my dad is a huge fan he has like all their old like records on you know album vinyl i i hate they came and performed at duke uh, when i was a freshman and, really? and he called us up on stage yes i got to go up on stage and dance I just awesome. the row, he was like come on up here they, were, <laughs> uh, they put on a fun show so yeah, yeah. i'd want to claim them for my movement too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course <laughs> well thank you guys for hanging out with us tonight this was fun i needed this i needed some laughs i hope you did too and yeah yeah what else um i'm not going back to africa <laughs> do you think you'd ever want to visit uh i guess <laughs> like, i don't know we're I guess I go Ethiopia and trace my roots. Maybe oh. I'm like a prince there. Oh. <laughs> it sounds like a plot of a movie. Yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Sonora. Thanks, Therese. Thank you, guys. Hey, Adam. Uh, so we're going to take off. I do want to just remind you, if you want to be in book club, we're doing it this Sunday. Anthony's going to be there. My husband. Pretty excited about that because he wanted to talk about this book, uh, The Real Anthony Fauci and robert f kennedy jr and you can go to the locals.com if you have trouble getting into the locals and figuring it out send us an email we're still working out the kinks figure out i, I did go through and make sure a bunch of people were approved today and we're figuring out how to do the video streaming um, but just email us it's deprogrammed pod at gmail.com again it's deprogrammed pod at gmail.com that's it thank you guys i hope you have a good wednesday night rest of your night 
Bye, everyone. Bye.